right. So today uh, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about sales, which we kind of talked about. We talked about marketing and entrepreneurship today, but we're going to one of the topics that we had for a while, um, and I guess you could say that we were saving it for a while was um, was today, and it's. Not, it's, it's not the briefest title. It's, I hate sales, and I have no clue what I'm doing. How do I get new customers? <laughs> but then again, we don't really do things that are pretty much boilerplate, so that kind of makes sense for us. So, um, But when I want to start off today, I was, I was actually, when I was taking a shower this morning, I was listening to TV, and there's this guy who has a sports talk show that I listen to, but he's more of like, he always makes these cultural references. So he makes analogies. So like if there's something going on in sports, he he ties it to an analogy about something. And I don't know why he brought this up, but he was talking about sales. He goes, he said, nobody, nobody goes to school for sales. It's not like you like graduate from high school and say, okay, I'm going to go to Fullerton and I'm going to major in sales. Like that doesn't happen. I'm going to go to UT, University of Texas. I'm going to go in sales. You can be in marketing. I had a minor in marketing. I had one class in sales and that was it. It was professional selling. That was about it. Um, but most people go in sales, he said, because they want to make money. But the problem is a lot of people in sales, from what I've seen, don't make money. They really struggle. And uh, maintaining some consistency, getting your feet underneath you, and understanding what you're doing, why it's working, or why it's not working is really tough. And so as a result, people get into sales, but they, they struggle. And it, it could be an individual person who is working for an organization. Let's say you're selling... Um, Windows 10 and Al is like, yeah, I need a new, I need a new laptop because my Windows 10 sucks. Um, or you're selling computer equipment or you're selling pharmaceuticals or you're selling um, plastic canisters. It could be anything. Uh, but a lot of people, when they get into sales, they want to make money. They like the, the, the freedom. They like being able to not have a structured job, not have to be in a cubicle all day. Uh, they could be extroverts. They love talking to people. But in the end, they, you know, they quickly realize that they don't know what they're doing. You know, for me, for example, I went into uh, sales and they, you know, they put you through like a two week training and some of it's product knowledge. And some companies have their own system or own their own way of doing things, their own methodology. And that's all great. But then you get actually come out into the real world, and the question is, can you use, or is what they teach you worthwhile? Is it, does it help you? Um, you know, and kind of what do you do with it? And, and it's kind of interesting because sometimes I think the system helps. It can add structure. People need structure in their life. They need something that they can kind of lean back on and build off of. Um, but I've had other times where it's, it's really interesting. There's one company I worked for that I was actually one of the best people that ever Honestly, one of the best salespeople they ever had there. Toot my own horn. Um, I got into management, and you know, I was in it for a couple years. And I had a new person come out of training, and I'm like, you know, is there about a weekend? I'm like, hey, how are things going? You know, just want to make sure I'm kind of touching base. Want to see if there's anything I'm missing. We're building a relationship, making sure the communication channels are open. And she was telling me this other, this other person in their training class got out of training and their manager said, hey, can I see your training book? And it's like, yeah, sure. So they handed the training book. He goes, come here. He walked over to the kitchen and threw the training book in the trash. And he goes, welcome to the real world. You're not going to need this here. So when it comes to training, a lot of people just don't know what they're doing. So they rely on their trainer. They rely on a methodology. I, I remember when I first started. I'm not sure about you, Al, but I remember when I first started um, and I thought, well, these trainers must really know what they're doing. I mean, the company picked them, you know, they spend this money, they hire people, they want people to succeed. So who do they put in charge? They must put the best people, people that know what they're doing can quickly and clear, uh, clearly articulate how to be successful. Um, and then what I found out later was and there's this and I'll and I'll throw a name I'm not gonna throw the full name out there but there's this girl Molly that I used to work with <clears throat> and she was the worst person on our team. I mean literally we had 15 people on our team and she finished dead last. And I sat right next to her and you know it got to a point where everybody kind of knew that Molly wasn't going to be on our team very long. And I think Molly knew that she wasn't going to be on our team very long. 
And so an opening came up for a trainer and she applied for it. And I'm just thinking, okay, whatever, like, you're not going to get that job. You suck. Like, what are you, you going to do? Train people how to miss their goal? Because you're really good at that. And uh, she got the job. It blew me away. And I'm like, these people don't know that Molly sucked in sales. I don't think the entire time I was there, she hit her, hit her goal once. I don't think once. Hmm. And this is the trainer. This is the person who, like, these people are, don't know anything about it. They're excited to work for the company. They just want to feel like, all right, they're they're learning what they need to learn to be successful, and they're and they're 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 the blind are being led by the blinder. Like at least the new people, you know, they don't know what they're doing, but they haven't mm -hmm. failed yet. Like this this girl, just I mean, no offense, she's a nice person. I like Molly. If I ran into her today, like she and I are friends. Well, until she listens to this podcast, but she sucked at her job. Like she was terrible at her job. And and to be honest, I would say that if I asked the people who I knew that we're good at our job about Molly. We say, yeah, she's nice, but we don't really respect her. Uh, and so the question is, what do you do? <laughs> and I knew, you know, coming out of training, it's like, okay, well, I knew what my training was, and my training really didn't help me all that much. It gave me a structure. It kind of gave me an idea of what the company wanted and, and things like that. But I really quickly had to realize, without anybody telling me, that I had to figure it out on my own. I had to figure out my own way to succeed, and I did. Um, and I'm not going to get into the, the nitty gritty on it, but basically I created kind of my own program um, that was just unbelievably successful and helped me out. And I did use a little bit of the training they had. I, I'm just, obviously the product knowledge helps. I'm not going to bag on that because even Molly could teach product knowledge. So, you know, that's, you know, pretty much anybody, anybody with a, a PowerPoint presentation and two hands and a voice could probably do it. And not even two hands. You only need one because you need to have the clicker. Unless, well, and you have the clicker, too, and you haven't used it yet, which I'm really happy about. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, well, before we get into what we're going to talk about, I just want to get your take on this, Al, before we move on. Sure. Oh, you want my take on it right now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like, um, I don't know. I've never asked you this question. Have you? I know you, you've kind of been in entrepreneurship and yes. academia a little bit. Yes. Have you ever been in sales? Have Absolutely. You? In fact, the first job... I ever had, really ever had, other than being a uh, self-employed entrepreneur type, that the, the first job I ever worked for somebody else where they gave me a paycheck uh, was going door-to-door uh, -door canvassing to set up appointments for heating and air conditioning guy, guys to go out and try to sell new homeowners heating and air conditioning. And it was... Uh, you know, it was like Poway out here in the San Diego area. Um, and that, that was just, yeah, uh, junior high. I uh, know, uh, second year of high school. So anyway, they, there's this job. And I think oh, if you're breathing, if your body is warm and you're breathing, they would have hired me. Okay. So I'm literally go they, a bunch of guys a ragtag motley crew gets into this minibus or van and they take us out to where all these new homes have been developed. And you can imagine 30 something years ago, a lot of new homes being built in the San Diego area. So there's these homes, they don't have lawns yet. They're just sitting there. And my job, along with these other guys, they drop, a, drop us off on different blocks and go knock on the door and give them the pitch and say, you up with a free uh, home inspection. Uh, the air conditioning heating guy is going to give you an estimate. He's going to give you a lot of good information. Anything, anything we could say, literally, to book that appointment. That's all we cared about was booking that appointment because that got us a bonus. All right, because we're literally on prac, almost straight commission. Okay, in fact, I think it was pretty much straight commission. I don't think there was uh, any salary or hourly involved. And I said, what the hell? I'll, I'll give it a try. And it was a, a very interesting experience. Um, it was interesting because of tremendous amount of rejection, of course. And I learned that sales, this is a long, long time ago, I learned that sales is basically about rejection. Dealing with rejection, fine tuning your pitch, and doing the numbers. Boss always said, numbers game. 
Um, you just keep knocking on doors. You get from one door to the next. If the person slams it, if the person says, I'm not interested, whatever, you do your best and then you move on. And that was the fundamental, the fundamentals of sales in that environment. And uh, I did okay. I did pretty good because I'm a talker. Obviously, wouldn't be doing a podcast if I wasn't a talker. And I am personable. Uh, so here's a young kid knocking on the door and they go, I said, listen, you got nothing to lose. Just have the guy come out here and I'll get all creative about the pitch and stuff. Anyway, I did that. Now, the, the one thing that I remember about this company was after our shift, we would go out for about four hours, five hours in the afternoon. Okay. We come back and in the office was a chilled keg of beer. And all the sales guys, eight to 10 sales guys would, after their, the shift, would, there was probably two shifts, maybe three, I don't know, but at least two. We'd all come back in in the afternoon around 4.35 or 5-ish, something like that. And we'd drink free beer. I remember that. And one day, uh, one, one of the salesman's guys said, hey, let's play this game. It's called Bing Bong Boom or something like that. And you go around in a circle, and if you miss your turn, and if you don't say the right thing, you have to drink. Well, <laughs> so the more you drink, the more mistakes you make. And so I brought, got to the point I was, I was F-faced, okay? I was drunk. I couldn't drive home. <laughs> they had to call my parents to get me. And I you're not having that job anymore. Go work at McDonald's or something. You can't do that job anymore because you're getting drunk. And that was crazy. Mom, you know, so <clears throat> I, I lost that job because I, not because I wasn't good at it, but anyway, it was time for me to move on. You know, the writing was on the wall, but I remember one guy, he was the best salesman, right? And he wasn't dressed in a suit. He always the one thing about him he, is he never tied his shoes. He wore tennis shoes and he never tied his shoes. He had kind of shaggy hair. He would always wear jeans and a t-shirt, you know. This and he never 70s, tied his right? shoes. I said, why don't you tie your shoes? He says, it's bad, bad luck. Bad luck to tie your shoes. So his shoes were always untied. This laces everywhere, right? And he would knock on the door and he was all Mr. Up, Mr. Positive and everything. And he got, he got the most appointments. He got the generated the most leads and he did pretty well so that was my first sales experience and from then on uh periodically during my life uh i would i would i would fall into a sales job now my opinion about most sales okay pure sales right not marketing not advertising not i'm talking about sales we used to call sales sales when it was belly to belly okay and we used to say when you're in that situation belly to belly it's who's going to sell who either they're going to sell you or you're going to sell them and it's always closing it's always about closing it's always about the sale you can be the friendliest guy in the world the smartest guy in the world the most persistent guy in the world you can have the best sales pitch you can have the most leads nobody cared they only cared about one thing. Did you either get the lead, i.e. make the appointment, or did you close the deal? That's all they cared about. And I never really had any sales job in my life where they paid me anything except commission. Now, here's the good, the good news and the bad news. Bad news is, on straight commission, that... If you don't sell, you don't make anything. You just spent four hours, five hours, six hours at a desk, on a phone, belly to belly, whatever, going out to some place, talking to some guy, wasting your time, wasting your gas, whatever, waste most of your time. And if you don't Definitely sell, money. you don't make money. The good news is this. If you're on straight commission and you work it right, you can make 10 times more money. Because when you do close a deal and you and you are, if you're good and you close the deals, the commission is great, okay? So that was my experience in sales. I spent a, a, a good portion of my, uh, when I was getting my bachelor's at San Diego State, I spent a good portion of that 
working two jobs. One job was 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day. Get on the phone and sell supplies for Telex and Twix machines. People don't even know what a Telex machine is. If you watch an old movie from the 40s, <laughs> maybe the 50s, you'll see a machine in the back that looks like a typewriter on steroids. And it's got this roll of paper in it, right? And this was back in the day. If you wanted to send a message from one place to another in the world, it was called Telex. And you would type it out. It would send it and it would show up on the other person's machine like a typewriter that types itself, okay? Yeah. By itself. <laughs> they have those in those message, old, right? They, that's how they do those old spy movies, like <laughs> the Russians. There were the two Russians kinds. Was, there was yeah. Telex and there was Twix. And my job was to uh, was to call, I'd have a stack of cards on my desk like this high. And some young guy was in charge of it. And he said, just call the number. And we had a pitch. Can I talk to the person in charge of your Telex machine? Then they would transfer me to somebody. There was always somebody in charge of it or supplies for it. Who's the person in charge of supplies for your Telex machine? So get to the person who can make the decision, who can buy. Then I would give them a pitch, and it was usually a bunch of BS. Yeah, I'm calling from Telex International. Uh, we're going to be closing our uh, warehouse down for physical inventory, so I'm just letting you know that uh, you're not going to be able to send you out our regular supply of paper and ribbon for the machine, um, but we do have some right now that we can send out to you. <laughs> you know, to make sure you don't run out. God forbid you should run out of paper. And uh, also those ribbons wear out and the little thing on the ribbon can fall into the machine and break the machine if it's, but we need to get you some ribbons too. To figure out what kind of paper they needed. Is it the quarter inch roll? Is it that, you know, is it that three and a quarter inch roll? And they would say, oh yeah, it's the quarter inch roll. Okay, so we've got two cases of that set aside for you. Um, can you get me the, a purchase order number for that? Then we'd wait. And the person, and it's a nuisance. It's a nuisance thing, okay? Is that you don't want to run out because you got to have it. Super important. You don't want to run out. At the same time, you don't want to have too much, but you don't really care. This person could have gone down the street to any place and probably bought paper and ribbon for the machine. But I'm on the phone with him, blah, 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 blah. So I'd get up. The main thing was to get that purchase order number because if you didn't have the PO number, okay, you, you, you didn't have the sale. So he'd get me, the, oh, the PO number is 7 12 and I go, okay, thank you. We'll get that right out to you. Sold. Went into the sold pile. Somebody else was responsible for calling, verifying, and shipping out telex and ribbon, telex paper and ribbons to these companies, these mostly big corporations. The mom and pops didn't care. These were big corporations. And of course, the paper that was shipping out to them was probably five to 10 times more expensive. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. If you have a telex machine, that's where you make your money. It's the paper. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, you got this huge hunk of thing. Anyway, my point was this. I'd spend four hours every morning, and you got to get up at 6 a.m. There was always coffee. So you get there a little bit early, you drink your coffee, you sit at your desk, and imagine a room with 15 people all talking. Hey, are you there? Yeah, are you the person? But the key was the leads, okay? You got the leads. If you didn't have the, 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 the leads, you had no business. You had nothing. So you had those leads. Somehow they had a database of these leads of, of corporations. and Now, I probably, you know, how many call, calls can you make if every call takes two minutes? You know, so for four hours, every two minutes, I'd be dialing, dialing, dialing. No automatic dialing, none of that. Very primitive. And I literally made what I thought was pretty good money back then, 30 years ago or so. I made over $1,000 a month part-time commission, okay? Plus bonuses, you know, free trip to Vegas if you're number one this month and all kinds of stuff. So that was my experience on the phone. And there were times when I went in in three hours, I didn't have a sale. Three and a half hours, no sale. Four hours is coming up and then boom, boom. I'd have a couple of sales. So I learned, number one, how to give a pitch on the phone, how to be incredibly determined, how to modulate my voice, how to sound friendly, how to get to the person who can say yes, all of those things. And I did that 
job for about a year, year and a half. Um, I've had so many different kinds of jobs. Okay. In the evening, I was a security guard and I would go to Cubic Corporation in San Diego <clears throat> about 5.30 and uh, with my guard uniform on and I would sit at the desk and then at six o'clock, practically everybody was gone. And I would sit there for another six or seven or eight hours, okay, till about one in the morning as a security guard. And once, once an hour, I'd get up with this big clock that was like this big that had a key. And I would go from station to station, would take me about 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20 at the most, take the key, punch it in there. So, you know, it was a record of every, my, 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 my tour around the, the plant you see? And I got minimum wage for that, but the rest of the time I studied. So they were literally paying me to study. <laughs> and between those two jobs, I made enough money and I studied hard enough that I, you know, got my degree and moved on, right? And fortunately, after that, I got into computers and, you know, the rest is history, but being in computers, but sales, I was selling computers, enough that I got out of selling computers and got into consulting and that got me on the road to eventually having my own so god when it comes to sales you know you can make it as uh oh well I'm having a little trouble with this notebook it says my internet connection is unstable don't worry about it I'm also a little unstable this morning too so That's anyway probably worth me... reading <laughs> When it comes down to sales, you can make it as complicated as you want, okay? I mean, you can get into theory, and then you can get into marketing, and then you can get into digital, and you can, but it really comes down to two things. Generating leads, which is prospecting, closing leads, which is sales, and getting money. Now, salespeople don't really care what happens after the sale closes that much, really. If the customer calls them back and says, I'm pissed, I want my money back. Yeah, they care because they're going to lose their commission. Okay. It's going to be taken out of their paycheck. But once the sale is made, I don't care if it's uh, 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 pumpkins on the side of the road or $100 million IBM computer mainframe systems or, uh, or some kind of service or whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, okay? The salesman just wants, the, wants as many deals as they can handle. <clears throat> they want to close them as soon as possible with the least amount of effort. <laughs> and song and dance, dog and pony show, whatever you want to call it. They want the money in their paycheck every two weeks, okay, or sooner, Sometimes there's companies out there that say, we pay you at the end of the day. If you close a deal, we pay you today. We pay you cash, blah, blah, blah. Of course, those days, not so much anymore, but they used to do that. Companies used to do that as an incentive. They also have bonuses. They also have re uh, rewards. They also give you trophies and medals and ribbons and God knows plaques and things. You know, They put your name up on the wall with a picture. Number one salesman this week, this month, this day, this minute, whatever. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> so there's that part of it. But um, that's all the salesman really cares about. Getting the money, the paycheck. Now they want All right, everybody, uh, looks like Al, hopefully we'll get him back in a little bit. Uh, for the magic of editing, uh, if we're having issues and he gets disconnected, you won't even see it because we'll go edit this out. Um, so we'll see. And by the way, I guess we'll just talk here because we're just gonna edit it out anyway, probably, but um, this is why I have a Mac. He, has, he had something going on with his Mac, and I think it was his Mac, and he had to use his Windows laptop, uh, whatever web laptop with Windows 10 on it. And before the show, we were just joking. We're like, let's see in fact. Yep, there he is. He's gone. So uh, what did we say beforehand? Um, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, he said, having a few issues this morning with my notepad computer, I should be okay. He goes, I hate Bill Gates, LOL. I said, you're coming around. He goes, I also hate Apple. I said, yeah, 
that you hate everybody. We have that in common. He thought that was pretty funny. And he said, like Dyson said, I just want it to work properly. Uh, we were talking about that. I mean, can you imagine if, uh, what's his name, Henry Dyson or Mike, not Mike Dyson, that's Mike Tyson, that's the boxer. Uh, can you imagine if Mike or, uh, what's the guy's name? Whatever, Dyson, Henry Dyson, I think, or whatever, the British guy. Uh, who makes like the best vacuum cleaner ever. He's like the Elon Musk of vacuum cleaners. Like if he could make a, if he could like, what he do with vacuum cleaners, man, if you could, if he ran Microsoft, I, you know, that whole thing, my biggest thing I hate with Microsoft is like, I'll have 17 things going on and, you know, I'll have Excel going, Word going, internet going, mail going, whatever, a number of different things going and something happens <laughs> And I'm having some issue, it's running slow or doing some some weird thing. And the IT, my IT guy will say, well, just go ahead and reboot your computer. I'm like, what? what do you mean go ahead and reboot? I have like 19 things going on. Like, it's 2020, like 2021 now. Like, can we not have a virtual environment? Can you like run it in one environment? Like even on my, on my laptop, I have a Mac. I have an, uh, an OS side of my Mac, my MacBook. And then I have a Windows side of my Mac can't run a virtual environment and run like two different environments and just have that in there. Like you got to have a way to do this. They can do everything now. I mean, look what these tech companies do. They can do everything now. All right. Al said he's logging. Uh, he will be right back. And I'm just saying, okay, filling time. Um, it's got to be a way to do it. I mean, if Elon Musk could basically start his own space company, completely not only just start by I don't know if he initially started but completely took over the EV market he's boring holes underground to build tunnels to go from like DC to <coughs> to Vegas in like or no that'd be great DC to New York in like an Austin Powers-esque um pod I, I used to do it in Kingsman too um and then he has Neuralink, which I've been reading about. And he's like trying to get blind people to be able to see or I don't know if it's like reading your mind or, or whatever he's doing. He's doing all that. And Bill Gates, who I guess we'll get into this. Bill Gates, the guy who supposedly is the person we're supposed to listen to when it comes to COVID and vaccines. Can't even figure out how to like get your computer going again without having to restart freaking everything. Like that's that's just a joke. And by the way. Bill Gates is a computer nerd. He went to Harvard, dropped out early, which I guess you're supposed to do if you have something like Microsoft or whatever you're launching. There's no sense sticking around, right? Um, he's a computer nerd. His dad is a eugenicist. Like, look at it. Look at his dad's background. Like, his dad killed more people than like like he didn't knife him to death. Like that would be bad. Uh, but his dad basically. Like killed a bunch of people, and he was involved in vaccines and using vaccines. Oh, and that's what he did too. He sterilized people. That, maybe he didn't kill them. Maybe he killed them. I think he did kill some, a bunch of people. But he was big into sterilization, and he was a eugenicist, very much like Margaret Sanger. And I'm not going to get into that topic entirely. But the guy, like his his goal and his family's track record is not like making your life easier and, and making sure that like you're healthy, like. He sterilized a bunch of girls. Like what Bill Gates did in Africa, he literally sterilized and killed a bunch of kids. I think it was in Mali. I can't remember the exact country, but like <laughs> this guy is the last person you want to listen to. And if they're sitting here going, if the country's sitting here going, we need to get more people vaccinated, okay, fair enough. I don't have a dog in a fight. You want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But like people that know who Bill Gates is, when you have Bill Gates telling you you need to get vaccinated, <laughs> no, 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 no. Anybody that was on the fence, is probably not going to get vaccinated. So, um, so anyway, if I were them, if I were in charge of the vaccination effort, trying to get everybody vaccinated, which is fine, I get that. Like, I have no problem with that. I, you know, if you want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But they have a PR problem, and you have a guy that is running, is the face of the movement, who is a terrible human being. Like, he's up there with Jeff Bezos. Like, he is really not a good, and like George Soros. He's really not a good person. And so I would probably get somebody like Oprah, you know, not the Oprah perfect, but like 
get somebody as Oprah, get somebody that is universally liked. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, I mean, that, that would be huge. Like, everybody loves Shaq. Uh, but they don't. But they don't. They get, they get like, one of the most evil people with a, with an unbelievable, terrible family track record of sterilizing young girls and killing people. Like, it's, it's just insane. Like, his reputation, when Bill Gates goes to Africa, everybody runs for the hills. Like, I don't know if there are hills in certain countries. But they run for hills, caves, forests, house, lock the door behind them. We're not letting you in. Like, this guy is bad, bad news. So anyway, when Al gets back on, we're going to talk about we'll talk about sales. <clears throat> uh, we're going to shift uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I know Al's kind of gone off on his little soliloquy, which is good. So I can do that as well. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about what not to do and what to do in sales. And this is just my perception. I never was like the most orthodox salesperson. I didn't grow up wanting to be in sales. I didn't really do sales. I didn't do sales in high school. I was a waiter. Actually, I wasn't even a waiter. I was a busboy. Um, in college, I was an usher at a baseball stadium right after college. Uh, I waited tables. I did that. Did I do that? Yeah, I did that in college, too, a little bit. Um, I never did sales. And my first job, I worked kind of what Al was talking about. He set appointments for, uh, for the telex or whatever. And <laughs> I worked over a a company where we had people that set appointments and we sold home improvement products and uh, and things like that. And I lasted three months in that job. And I think I was like, I went from, there were 13 people in the office. I went from 13th and tenure to I think third. And I didn't sell a single thing. So I sucked at sales. I wasn't good. Uh, I worked at a bank. Wasn't really all that great. And then I figured it out. I figured out some things that worked for me. Um, initially, and I, you know, the, the, later on at the bank, I didn't suck the whole time I was there. Uh, later on at the bank, I actually figured out how to be good at sales, and uh, it was more referrals. It wasn't necessarily closing the sales, but I was actually really, really good at that. Um, and I figured out a way to do that, keep things really simple. All right, he says he's logging in, but it's very slow waiting. Um, so, but we'll be fine when he comes back. He, He'll have to listen to this podcast and know what we talked about. Um, so anyway, how often does that happen? You get somebody that, that has, is a podcast host and they don't even know what, <laughs> what's going on in their own podcast. So um, but anyway, but yeah, so, you know, I went and kind of was okay in sales, didn't blow anything away. And then, you know, I started this one company and that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier, how, you know, I had to kind of figure it out and make my own way and design something. And I'm not going to get into the whole detail of it, but it was like I took a path and a philosophy about what I wanted to do in my sales job that was never taught. In fact, it was the opposite of what was being taught. It was the opposite of everything I read. I, man, I read a lot of sales books. And it was the opposite of what was being said. So, uh, but for me, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what to do or what not to do. Start off with what not to do. That makes more sense. Uh, in sales, and, and this is just my opinion, obviously, but I think it works for people who aren't necessarily good at sales, don't have a track back, a, uh, a big, strong track record when it comes to sales, and you know can kind of be intimidated by the whole structure of it. And like, you have to know about product knowledge, and you know, there's there's any number of different philosophies and approaches to sales that you can have. And uh, we're going to keep things very simple, something that anybody can use. It's almost like Sales for dummies, sales for rookie dummies. Um, and then we're going to talk about specifically what to do. And I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to tell you, like, do this, then this, then this, then this, because it doesn't work, right? Uh, we're going to talk about specifically what to do. So with that in mind, Al is still trying to get on his two computers. This is literally, this is exhibit A of why I will never have a, a, a PC again. And I shouldn't say never. You know, if Microsoft can actually get out of the 90s and actually do something different and, and offer something that nobody else offers, and that's great, because that's kind of what Apple does. Apple kind of creates the whole pinch and the swipe and whatever all the finger gestures are. Uh, but Windows in, or Microsoft is not exactly known for being a trailblazer. You know, they're a big behemoth. They're not a speedboat that can cut on a dime. They are one of these Panamax oil tankers Apple kind of got stuck in the Suez Canal. I think it's still stuck. I haven't even heard about it. They got that out. 
but Panamax oil tankers that really just take forever to turn and they're not very mobile. You know, they can handle a lot of stuff. They can do a lot of things. But, you know, as far as being able to wow you, it's kind of interesting. The big first big tech company, well, I guess the first big tech company is probably IBM, but the first really, like, software tech company, for the most part, that was a mass appeal software tech company was Microsoft. And you ever notice, off? you ever notice they don't have anything that that, that means software platform? Like, they just don't. They don't have a phone. They have a social network. I mean, they had MSN, which is kind of news, but like, that's a spam company. Uh, he says, still waiting. I'm not sure why. I'm going to say, hurry up with a smiley face on it. Hurry you. No, hurry up. There we go. Um, <clears throat> they had MSN, but like, the only reason people even use MSN is because. It's on, it's, it's baked in. It's like their whole antitrust thing from the 90s. It's baked into um, their computer. So like if you're a corporation and you buy a thousand of these computers, it has Windows on it. It has the Internet Explorer as the default search engine. And it has MSN as the default homepage, right? And so that's really the only pe reason people use it. If it wasn't in that setting, I, I really think MSN would be gone. Like there's no reason for it to even be there. Um, and, and the same thing with, it's funny, I used to use Microsoft advertising, so I was thinking like my target market are these people in corporate America, these salespeople that are at the desk, the same people that Al talked about. And I went to go use them, I'm like, this would be perfect. Like, it's exactly what I wanna target. Like, I just wanna be on MSN's website. Like, I, it's, it's a total clickbaity website. Not that I wanna do clickbaity, but it's gonna, like, people are gonna be like spending a lot of time on this one website, just because Microsoft is the one driving it. And I got to tell you, if you thought Microsoft, if you thought my opinion of Microsoft was bad to begin with, and I don't like Bill Gates, and I don't like their software, and it's not really cutting edge, and it doesn't really do anything special, I'm telling you that Microsoft advertising team is horrible. Like I went to use them, and I was committed to spend money with them. Like they were, they might have, they 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 really had a shot to be my main advertising uh, vendor. <laughs> All right, so he's still trying to get back on. This is definitely not a infomercial for Microsoft. Uh, but yeah, I was doing it and I was like, all right, well, you know, I registered for it and they had a rep already. So I'm thinking, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Like you don't normally get a rep when you sign up for Facebook ads or Google ads or anything like that. And you can probably call in and talk to somebody, Google, maybe a little bit more than Facebook. And it turns out this guy didn't really know what he's doing. I could tell on the phone that you know, he wasn't really an expert on it. He had to navigate through some things. Um, the ability for them to do a walkthrough is really clunky, like really clunky, like 15 years old, like software clunky. And it was just, it was, I didn't want to say it because the guy was trying his hardest, but the guy, uh, you could tell he was just trying to manage through it, but the process itself just was terrible. And you have a guy who's not really an expert on it, did not exactly give me a ton of, uh, didn't exactly give me a ton of confidence in what they're doing. And then when we finally did get to the advertising portal <coughs> for the dashboard, it was terrible. Like, first of all, the ability to target people sucked. Like it was terrible. Uh, and then I actually did, you know, I got through it, I pushed through it. Like I said, I was committed to spend money on it. I was like, this could be a really good platform for me. And then I finally, let's see, you said, we may have to do this one next Tuesday. So I'll just say, let me know. And we're just going to wrap this. We'll, we'll finish this up and wrap this episode up uh, in a second if you can't get on. So we'll see what he says. So, but we can actually get to the platform. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty much committed to, to spend money on this. And I set up a, a, I set up a what do you want to call it, campaign. I had targeting set, not great targeting set. Um, all right, Al's coming back on. So, and it never spent any money. So I'm gonna keep him waiting for a second. It never spent any money. I tried, and, and they wouldn't take my money. None of the ads ran. And I talked to the guy, and he couldn't figure it out. And he kept calling me back, and couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. So, anyway, that's why you should never have anything with Microsoft do. You can avoid it. So let's get Al back in the room. All right, Al, are you there? 
All right, he's coming back. By the way, that's a lot of uh, acronyms he's got at the end of it. He's got more letters in his acronym, so I'm going to tell him that. He's got more letters in an acronym than he does in his name. I think it's pretty funny. So, kind of crazy. We both have MBAs. He has a PhD. I could not even imagine going through a PhD program. That took a long time. And psychology is interesting to me, but not enough to spend four years. And I think you have to do like practicum hours to get your PhD or license, or I don't know if you have a license, but <laughs> man, that's a program that you really, really, really need to be committed to and like if you're going to go through it. Hey, Al, are you there? All right, I think I can hear you. Are you there? All right, this is an example, again, why Microsoft sucks. <clears throat> this is like a time machine. Like if we decided we're going to do this call, we're going to do this podcast in 1999. This is about kind of what I'd expect. Kind of about what I'd expect. Um, so we'll see what's going on. That is, all right, you there, buddy? Hopefully. We will see. Yeah, we have everything but the modem dial-up at this point. <laughs> All right. yeah. Dude, uh, I am seriously uh, do not know why everything is so freaking slow on my computer today. It, All right. Well, I will tell you this. Unbelievable. I just, I didn't miss a beat the entire time we were gone. I just decided to go solo and... I uh, was railing on a couple topics that you will want to listen to when we load this episode live. So I will just say that. Um, okay. Yeah, it will not be edited. I thought I was going to edit it, but I just kind of went right through it. So All right. Um, okay. With that being uh, said, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we were talking about sales. I want to talk about specifically what I told the, the audience that was listening while you were gone is we're going to talk about, you know, you know, when I got into sales, I didn't know what I was doing. I had to kind of figure my own way of doing it out. I did use some of the things the company told me, but for the most part, I had to kind of, I had to make my own thing to make it work. And so in my opinion, I'm going to give some ideas of what not to do and then what to do in sales. So they're not specifically do A, then B, then C, then, you know, E, then, well, there's no D, so whatever. Um, but we'll talk about some things, <laughs> some general concepts that I think you, you really want to avoid at all costs if you want to be successful at sales. And then we're going to talk about some, some uh, specific approaches to take uh, to actually to give yourself the best chance to be successful. It's not a guarantee you're going to be successful because nobody can do that, um, but there's some concepts. So specifically, we're going to talk about what not to do. And this is one of the things that I talked about where you were gone a little bit was, although I didn't really mention it, um, is that a system is not going to, will not get you success. Like you're not going to walk into a company and they're going to say, okay, we want you to do X and Y and Z. So back in your company, you were setting appointments. I worked for a company where we had appointment setters. And like, if you get on the phone and you say this, it's not like the Wolf of Wall Street. It kind of is the Wolf of Wall Street in a sense, but like, it's not like you're going to just read off a script and all of a sudden people are going to go, sure, let's go. Perfect. No, it's not going to work like that. So if you run into somebody that says, we have the sales program and if you follow our system, because I've heard that more times than I can count. If you follow our system, you're going to be successful. And that's just flat out not true. It's not true. Because people are dynamic human beings. We all have our own way of doing things. We all have BS detectors. And, you know, we all kind of approach conversations, whether you're the customer or the salesperson, um, from very different positions. Now, Secondly, I would say you don't want to focus on your own needs. And this was probably the most important thing for me to do because there were times when, <clears throat> you know, you have a goal set up. Everybody that's in sales to some degree is a type A personality. You might be a partial type A, um, but you're not going to be like an art hippie chick, you know, who just wants to sit around, you know, doing her own art, playing guitar in the park if you're in sales. Like you're going to have some love A type personality uh, to some degree. And so we want to hit our own, we want to, you know, we have goals, we push ourselves, we, you know, we have sales managers that push sales goals and we need to hit. We have higher ups that push the sales managers that push us. <clears throat> and it's really easy to really focus on our own needs and say, okay, well, hey, it's halfway through the month and I'm 
not even a third of the way there or maybe a quarter away to my goal. I need to you know, get things going. I got two weeks. I need to get things going. And the problem is <laughs> behind that, the idea, and, and I'm going to have you touch on this in a little bit, is that you're basically using somebody for your own benefit, right? You're thinking that you can manipulate somebody. And I want to hear, we're going to hear some of your PhD approach to this because, <laughs> again, we don't have, I don't have this on my side, but you're basically trying to get, you're trying to manipulate somebody to do something for your own benefit only. So if, they, if you get the sale, I'm sure it'll benefit them, but that's not what most salespeople think about when they're, when they're you know, behind on their goals for the month or for the year, or for the quarter, or for the week. Um, so I would say number one is you have to complete, not only just not focus on your own needs, you have to completely forget about them because they're going to poison your mindset um, your tone of voice, all your nonverbal body language and intonate, vocal intonation, we're going to talk about verbal, gets way off, it's desperate, and people can smell desperation a mile away. Um, and I say that because, you know, I got to a point where I was one of the top people in my company and I had a week where I just did zero, which was like, like that gets everybody's attention, the bagel week. And, and so I was like, all right, well, whatever, take a bagel happens you know in a given year you're going to sell x a number of things you're going to get this number of deals come in you know maybe it doesn't happen this week but maybe the next week will be better you'll make it up some other time because you're going to get it at the end of the year you're going to get x number no matter what and so the next week comes up monday <clears throat> zero tuesday zero so i'm going at least seven and i don't know the week before the prior week if i had a friday with a zero or whatever but i'm, I'm going at least seven days in a row was zero. And I'm walking into Wednesday and I'm like, dude, like what is going on? I've never had a week where I did zero, much less seven days. And like, I don't really have anything on, like, I'm not expecting anything. So at this point, I'm like, there's nothing that I'm like, oh yeah, Wednesday is going to be great. Um, you know, because I have all this stuff coming in. And I'm like, holy crap. And so I was sitting at my desk thinking, man, this program that I wrote for myself, this whole methodology that I do, <clears throat> maybe it doesn't work anymore. Like, and then I thought to myself, I was going through it and I was like, <clears throat> well, yeah, no, it totally worked. So like, it didn't just stop working one day, but then I'm like, okay, well maybe I'm doing something wrong. And so it's like, when I played baseball, if you get into a batting slump, it's because usually, <clears throat> I mean, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. You have a bad week. Right. Um, but sometimes or a good pitcher. Yeah. Or a good pitcher. Right. It could be right. Or <clears throat> it could be anything, but sometimes your mindset sucks. Sometimes your stance is off. Sometimes you're, you know, looking for a certain pitch when you shouldn't be. It could be any number of things. So you start to analyze it and think, okay, well, am I, the system works, but am I doing, <clears throat> or my program works, am I doing something wrong that I need to tweak? And I'm thinking, I'm going through like, like feeling desperation now, well, kind of a little bit now, but like, <clears throat> am, I, am I doing something fundamentally wrong? Am I executing wrong? And I realized, no. And I said, all right, well, what I need to do is I just need to forget those seven days and just, we're going to start from scratch today. We're going to see what happens. And to be honest, I didn't really work that hard. And that day I had four sales come in, um, which was my weekly goal. And then, uh, what is it? I had, no, I had two sales come in that day. I had two sales come in the next day. And then I had four sales come in Friday, which is like, is it that on that day I did enough for I do for a week. And so I led my team and it was one of the, I think I might've been one of the top three in the whole company that week. And to be honest, I didn't work that hard. Like I literally was loafing it. Like my work ethic sucked that week, especially the back half of the week. And everybody just kept bringing the signed contract to me, like off the fax machine back when they had fax machine, off the fax machine. And my boss was standing there and he just saw this and he was like, his jaw was dropped and uh, it was just one of those things where I realized, you know, you can't really get in. And I remember saying to myself, it was a phrase that I, I would teach people when I manage. I'm like, you don't focus on the day or even the week. You focus on the month and the quarter. And so you're going to have a good day. Like that Friday, I had an amazing Friday and work hard. There were other days I worked harder and I, you know, probably had nothing to show for it. Um, but it all evens out. If you're doing what you're going to do, it doesn't mean you, there's no guarantee you're going to have a linear production. You know, it's going to go up or down, but it's just how you manage the down and you just know the ups are going to come. And so I had, you know, use that baseball analogy. I had a season where I started 0 for, was it 0 for 19 or 0 for 21 one season. I mean, it's like 
you get up there and it's like, man, I can't even remember the last time I got a hit. And I took the same approach and I'm like, all right, I'm just not going to do anything differently. And I went off like for the rest of the season, I went off, I hit 400 for that season, which in baseball is like a number nobody gets. I mean, I just had a crazy, crazy rest of the season. I was hitting everything. So, um, but anyway, the one thing I found out is you don't want to put pressure on yourself. You don't want to focus on your own needs. You focus on the person you're trying to help. If you're really trying to help, uh, if you're trying to actually, and your motives are right, I think you're going to be in a good spot. Uh, the last thing uh, that we talked about again, and, and again, I guess I kind of alluded to a little bit before, was just not to put pressure on yourself to get the sale. And that's really easy to say because you might have one, it's like you don't want to get written up. You don't want to lose. So if you're on all commission, you're working for free, man. If you don't hit those sales, you're working for free. And you're actually spending money to work at that job because you're spending money on gas and, and other things that you're laying down expenses for. Um, but the more times you put pressure on yourself to make the sale, like you have a really good customer on the line and you know, you're like, man, I really need this sale. Um, it never happens. And that brings something up. I was talking to a couple people about this week is like the biggest four letter word in my life is not a curse word. It's the word need N E E D. Um, I never use it toward myself ever. I made a decision a long, long time ago. Like I'll use it for other people. I'm like, Al, you need to get back on online you know <laughs> you know you need to you, hey you owe me money you need to pay me back my money it could be any number of things right but the minute i say i need yeah then all of a sudden i'm putting undue pressure on myself and i'm kind of cornering myself and it's like man i need to get the sale well i can't control that you know i can control i can control whether i'm a nice soft target that people want to buy from for sure uh, i can control whether i even want to take it like somebody might even want to buy from me and i just I may not want to deal with them because I have a feeling they're going to be a total pain in the butt for me. Uh, but you don't want to put pressure on yourself. Now, off of that, what are the, of those three things? If there's anything you want to add, what are some things that you would say in sales what not to do? Oh, my God. Um, well, really, we could talk for hours and hours about this, and we only really have about another 15, 20 minutes max. Um, I've, heard, I've heard, I heard something recently. Somebody, somebody made the statement that, most salespeople aren't very good because they don't believe in their product. Now, that could be taken two ways. They don't believe in the product they're selling, X, Y, Z, whatever the heck it is, the flavor of the month, God knows what, or they don't really believe in themselves. And I'll tell you this, you're never, never going to be a good salesperson Good meaning make money, sell product, unless you have confidence. But it's a catch-22 because you're not going to have confidence until you see success, some level of success. So there's this weird twilight zone psychological state where you vision yourself, you see a vision of yourself successful. You believe that vision. You can't kid yourself. You have to believe it. And then it starts to happen. But there's that, that no man's land in between where you're not really successful, but you must believe you're successful in order to be successful. But I'll guarantee you this. If you don't have confidence, if you don't believe you're successful, you won't be unless you're the luckiest son of a gun on the planet. So there's that psychological factor. Okay, now, the other thing I like to say is that systems will not make you successful true but if you're in a bad system it's that it's going to be 10 times harder because you could be doing what you need to do but the product is crappy the follow-up is crappy the the customer service is crappy everything is crappy but you okay you're going to have a you might have a little bit of success but your leads are going to dry up because the word is out that you're selling a crappy product your customers are happy after they they buy it from you, thinking that everything is going to be great and it turns into Windows 10, you know. Uh, it's just a pig, you know. Um, you you could be, you got to be also have the right timing. You know, if you're selling buggy whips door to door right now, you're not going to have a lot of success, except maybe in some neighborhoods, okay? I won't say where. But let me just tell you this. So 
a big part of it is psychological. A big part of it is the product, the how how good the product is, your competition. You know, if 10 people have knocked on the freaking door before you got there and you're the 11th one, guess what? You know? Um, well, let me let me say a couple things on that. Because I sure. think, um, so number one, I would say if your product is terrible, like if it, it legitimately, somebody buys your product yeah. and it's not good, no, right? Like it's, it's bad. Selling, then I would say that you're not doing yourself any favors. You need to find another company. Absolutely. Like you just do. I mean, really, you, you do. Just fail on it. You do. You're not, you, you don't really want to develop a reputation for selling something um, that sucks. And you really don't want to have, I don't want to look at myself in the mirror and say, I'm taking their money for something that I know isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. So I just wouldn't want to. Psychopath. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when it comes to selling, when it comes to customer service, you mentioned that, like, if the customer service sucks, well, I would actually, I'm going to differ with you on that. Uh, Because one of the things I realized when I was in, I used to do uh, recruiting for post secondary education. And so we would do online school for people that really couldn't go in person. Mm. And I recruited and I knew part of my job was I was onboarding, get them through the first class, make sure they're prepared, make sure they, they're kind of doing everything they need to succeed. And then I handed them off to their financial aid person and their academic advisor. And the one thing that I quickly realized was, and, and they're listening, they're going to remember this and they know it's true. They were terrible at their job. Like I, I, they, I did not want to leave these people that I had nurtured and done an amazing job with, and super prepared. And, and they had a great, you know, great experience with me and leave them with these fools because these fools just like they didn't. It, it's not even that they were bad at their job. They just were like derelict at their job. And that's the perfect word for it. And so I quickly realized, man, if they're going to be successful, then I need to learn how to replicate and improve that process surreptitiously. And so I actually went and learned what they did, like everything they did questions they were going to ask, what they needed to do. Um, and I basically kind of back channeled it. So like I knew the schedule that generally people would get set up, depending on how many credits you came in with or where you came up, I, I kind of knew the schedule that you were going to have. And so I would basically say, hey, when you talk to this person, this is kind of the schedule that you're going to set up. So make sure you get this set up that way. So I'm taking the choices, the bad choices out of their hand. If it's financial aid, look, I'm gonna, I want you to send me all your financial aid stuff and I'm just gonna hand it to them directly because a financial aid person was not a good callback person. No so there's money on the line. Like you need to do that. So just send it all to me. I'll get it taken care of before you even have a conversation with them. Uh, Cause I don't want you to depend on them. So I would say this, when it comes to customer service, you can, uh, you can, you can change that. Now on the other side, I also had expectations where I would, um, I set very specific expectations, how to call me, how to contact me, um, what the times were, um, and what you needed to do, you know, for that. So that I'm not sitting here, like, because I had an insane amount of students, right? I, I did really well. I just don't want to spend all my day handling customer service calls. And so I set some, some very strong structure. If you have this, this is what you need to do. This is your time frame. I'm going to give you tools on how to figure it out ahead of time. I knew what the most, it was like FAQ pages, right? I knew what the most common questions are, and we're going to solve them proactively so that I don't even have to handle the phone call. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that's one thing that's on there. But um, as far as, you know, as far as the product, if the product sucks and it's, and people are going to have a bad experience and there's no way around it, you just need to do something else. You really do. Um, But if it's something where it's a subjective aspect and you feel like you can make an impact on that, and you don't have to rely on like, okay, I'll sell you this this copy machine, but then if there's customer service, you have to dial this one eight hundred cuff one eight hundred number that gets you to Bangladesh or to India. And these people don't know what they're talking about, and they're just reading off the script, and they're not allowed to deviate from it. All right, well then, like I, I told them, and like, look, I, I said, you didn't hear this from me, but your financial aid advisor and academic advisor are not the best people in the world. I already know how to do their job, and we're going to do that ahead of time. I'm just letting you know, if you call them, they may not call you back as quickly as possible. And it's not because we don't care. It's because, unfortunately, it's just the luck of the draw. But I know that ahead of time, so I don't want mm-hmm. you to have that experience. Mm-hmm. And so I think you can change that service experience um, <clears throat> and really design it however you want to. But when it comes to the, the system, you can rely. I mean, the, you don't want to rely on a blank system 
you can have a structure, which is important. Like when I did that job, there was a very basic structure on how we recruited and how we mm -hmm. kind of walked through it. Um, and, I, and I kept it very loose and I followed their structure a little bit, but man, I filled in everything. I mean, they gave mm -hmm. me the bread and I put everything inside the sandwich. <clears throat> right, right, right. Um, so let's do this. Let's do this so we yeah, can wrap up in a time. We should wrap so we're going to talk about what to do. <clears throat> um, and these are just my takes. <clears throat> I don't think really any of these three, well, maybe one of the three you might see in a book, but for the most part, if you read a sales book and, or a Dale Carnegie book or a John MacArthur book or anybody, <clears throat> Zig Ziglar, you're probably not going to read any of these three, maybe one at most. <clears throat> uh, but this is my, my recommendations from somebody who sucked at sales, had no background in sales, never wanted to be in sales, and then happened to find, you know, the, 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 the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow completely mm. unexpectedly. So <clears throat> the first one I would say is you want to be different from the crowd. And the reason is this, and this is kind of, this kind of goes into your area a little bit, psychology, is that when you talk to somebody, they're, immediately their brain's going to try to lump you in with a group. They're going to try to do, in a sense, stereotype you. The, their brain has, and, and you can talk to this in a second, your brain has a need, as far as I understand, to try to make sense of the world. And then when you're talking to them, it's like, okay, who does Al remind me of? And it's a very subconscious thing. Or, and Matt is acting like this, and, and it kind of like subconsciously, <clears throat> you know, kind of reminds me of this. And if I'm trying to act like every other salesperson in my company, mm -hmm. I'm trying to be super official, mm -hmm. and I sound like every other salesperson they've ever talked to, guess what they're going to do? They're going to treat me like every other salesperson that they've ever talked to. And by the mm -hmm. way, what do they say to those people? They say no. Go away. Go they away. Go they away. hang up. They ghost you. They, they make up some excuse. They lie to you. They'll do anything. Yeah. And, and they, just, they just hate. People hate conflict. They just, you know, so what you're doing is it's like you're going in to World War II to fight the Nazis, and you're putting on a Nazi uniform. Like... You're going to get people shooting you that don't necessarily have to do that. Like, you're in, it's like going into a war and putting on a hunting vest. Like, why would you do that? You wear camo. Like, don't make them think that you're a target. Like, you want to be different. You, and you, the idea is, and this is more physiology than psychology, but there's a part of your brain called the pulvener. It's inside of your, your cerebral cortex. And its whole job is to make sense of new stimuli. And when you have routine stimuli, it basically it reroutes that stimuli, the directions for it, to a subconscious part of your mind that's designed to just get rid of it. It's why when you're driving your car and you want to turn left, you don't have to think, which way do I push the blinker, up or down? You just know. You push the, you push the little blinker thing down. You don't think about it. You just do it. You know, you can have a remote. You can be on your phone. You don't have to think about where your phone, your, your hand goes or your thumb goes. You just know it. And that's what that does. And, and what happens is that pulvener, what it does is it gets rid of salespeople that will never buy from you. So you have mm. to be different. You have to give people new stimuli. And at the same, for me, it was fun. Like, I, I like listening to people that were in my call center, and they just sounded like the same people. I'm like, I don't want to be like the same people. I don't want to be the same person as, as anybody in my whole life, much less do this. And so mm -hmm. when I started to realize that I'm different, it stokes curiosity in the person that I'm talking to. And what happens is instead of them saying, no, thank you, I already have one, whatever the BS response they would give, they start asking me questions, which mm -hmm. is really important um, because it gets them engaged in the process. Um, secondly, I would say you want to be yourself. And this is probably the only thing that you might see in one of those sales books is, is understand it's the, counter, it's the countervailing side to a system won't get you success. Is you have to understand that people are going to buy from you. They're not going to buy from your company. They may, they may love your product, but really, they're going to buy for you because you're the gateway to any customer service issues. You represent the company. <clears throat> they might buy the product, but they see you as the embodiment of that product. Um, and they can tell. Like, they can tell if, if you're being honest or not. It's, you know, it's kind of funny. I was telling somebody this past week. It's like when I go to a restaurant, and I, and I, and I don't know. Let's say I'm, I'm, at, I'm in between two things that I want to order for dinner or two beers that I want to order. I'll ask the server. I'm like, hey, what do you think between these two? Mm -hmm. And if the first sound out of their mouth is an inaudible non-word, I don't get it. So I'm like, hey, what do you think about that cedar plank salmon? They're like, hmm, ah, uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Nope, I'm not getting it. I'm done. I don't even, I don't care what you have to say. 
But when you really, like, if they came out and said, well, I don't like Taylor. Okay, well, fair enough. You know, they're, they're not the person I need to ask. Um, but if they say, oh, no, it's great. Or, oh, it's, you know, yeah, it's pretty good. Like, then I'll listen to what they're saying. But if the first word out of their mouth is a sound, mm, hmm, I'm not going to do it. Um, but if the, the person who you don't trust as a server is the one that says, if you ask them, what do you think about this? And you're like, oh, it's great. And then you eat it and it's terrible, right? You may get that one sale, but you're never getting a repeat sale. So the more that you're yourself, the more people are going to trust you and the more people are going to um, honestly take cues. So if you have a follow-up sale or an upsale or a service contract that you're trying to sell or something like mm -hmm. that, then they're more likely to want to buy from you if they sense that you're legitimately being yourself and you're divorced from this blank suit that you're occupying. Now, the last thing I would say is this, is we talked about trying to get them to ask a lot of questions. The biggest thing that I find that, that really helped me out was I would get somebody on the phone and the first thing that I quickly realized was I said to myself, these people aren't just a potential sale. I was like, I don't even know these people. Like these people might buy from me and they might be a total soul sucker where they, they buy from you once, they buy your cheapest mm -hmm. product, they buy from you and they call you every day, mm -hmm. nonstop, every day asking questions and they're taking up all your time and you just get to a point where you ask yourself, man, I, I, or you say to yourself, I just really wish I, I never even let these people buy for me. It's like inviting Mormons in your house. Like, why would you do that? Like, like let's just invite a bunch of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, maybe some Amway people. We we'll get some timeshare salesmen in there. And, you know, let's invite them in our house. Because the odds, and maybe even try to sign up for a gym membership while we're at it. Because, like, the odds of getting them out of your house is zero. But I realized when you need, you know, when you're at a point where uh, you just start asking questions and you're curious about them, you get to a point where you're not trying to sell them anymore, but you're actually just trying to vet them out. And quickly you get to realize who is a good customer, who's serious, who's not serious, and then you kind of direct the encounter and you can, you can really create a situation where you can get a lucrative client and you don't have them basically calling you every two every two hours where you end up babysitting them the whole time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what's your take on that, Mr. Mr. Horn? PhD, well, MBA, PhD? There's a lot to it. It's complicated. Um, I think there's some good points there. You know, uh, it, it's a never ending learning curve. Okay. If you're going to be in sales, be prepared for frustration, but be prepared for being on a learning curve forever and ever because you're always dealing with people and people are a never ending source of questions wrapped in an enigma, okay? Surrounded by God knows what. Anyway, um, yeah, those are some good points, but uh, I would recommend that the people, the guys that are guys and gals that are listening to this, if they're in sales, if they're entrepreneurs, it means the same thing. If you're an entrepreneur, you're in sales. If you're in sales, you're an entrepreneur. That's the way it works. Um, but I would like to uh, like them to reach out to us at our at our emails and and let us know what they think about sales, what they think about entrepreneurship, what they'd like to see and hear about in the podcast. And uh, if they have a particular question about any of those subjects, send it out to us. I guarantee you that I will respond. I will respond to the email. And um, I might even set up a, 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 a conversation with you about it. If you're out there listening, please contact us. Let us know what you think. And if you have any questions, let us know that too. I appreciate it. All right. Good deal. Anything else, bro, you want to wrap up today? We covered a lot. We <laughs> by the way, you do need to, while you were gone, we had our own little separate mini podcast while you were gone. So you might want to check that out when we, uh, All right. when we upload that up. But anything else, we'll any parting thoughts before we head out? No, that's it. Just, just hope the internet works and hope your computer works and good luck. Yep. Um, and I would just say this, um, when it comes to sales, just nobody else is going to save you. You're going to make your own money and uh, your sales manager isn't going to know how to make you succeed. You're going to have to figure it out yourself. Um, but the key thing is this is the genius is inside of you. So if you have any questions, if you're in a sales job and you're struggling, uh, you're new to a sales job and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I want to get a head start. 
uh, reach out to both of us. We're both really good at that. We'd love to help. If you feel more comfortable talking to Al, then yes, I will be offended, but that's all right. I'll get over it. There are lots of psychiatrists with open time slots, and I'll be more than happy to fill one of them. Um, <laughs> but if you want to talk to me and ask any questions on that, we're more, I'm more than happy to help as well. Again, this is this is kind of our give back to the world, and and uh, there's no upsell. You're not going to call, and it's not like a timeshare where you're going to call us, we're going to help you, and, and we're going to ask for your Venmo account three minutes into the conversation. We want to do a value wait at ask least, for you. I wait at least 10 minutes. Yeah, my, mine's about, I don't know, eight. So <laughs> talk to Al, it'll, you'll probably be good for 10. You get me, you got seven and a half minutes. Um, but obviously, if it's something that's more in-depth and you're like, man, I really want to work with one of these guys to really, really dig deep and, and, and do... Um, you know, some really hard prep and, and make sure that we're doing successful. Yeah, then, you know, the workman is worth his wages and, you know, it is something we charge for. We're not stupid. I mean, we have to pay rent, mortgage, and all that fun stuff too. But as far as just quick hitters, if you have any questions, anything you need to help with, any just obstacle or uh, bottleneck that you're running into, we'd love to help out. So uh, with that being said, if, you've not, if you have not subscribed to this podcast on the platform you're listening to, please do today. That way you get notified immediately of any... Um, upcoming episodes. Uh, beyond that, appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, my name is Matt. And I am Al. And we will see you soon. Adios, muchachos. Ayala. <laughs>